How many of you are glad in this house of God? Amen. Only a few hands. If you are glad, lift your hands. Hallelujah. All right. So I just want to pick from where I left last time. Okay, this is what last time also I told. But then uh, God really want to uh, uh, speak this to you all. So uh, we've been, I've been uh, uh, preaching on this series of how God is building an army and how he is going to use this army to fight certain spiritual things uh, in the spiritual reality. And he's, he's, he's inviting everyone to be part of this army. And this army is going to be powerful and it's going to be massive. And we're going to, uh, we're going to really going to get into this fight and we're going to win many victories. And God is preparing this army. If you, if you see that a couple of months before I started with the Balm of Gilead, where every soldier need the rest, healing, comfort, all of that. And then when we came to the next one is the Gilgal, where you make allegiance with God. You identify yourself with God in this battle. And then God said, okay, if you are with me, then uh, uh, in my army, there are disciplines that you need to live by. So we learned upon the disciplines. And then God also said, in addition to this army, I'm going to bring various kinds of people to be part of this army. So this is what we've been uh, preaching and discussing on. And uh, uh, the previous uh, couple of weeks before I preached continuing in continuation of the sermon, God fights for you in, uh, in, in the Porur uh, center where God really wants to fight for you, for certain people especially. And uh, God taught many things. And especially when I preached on God fights for you. So our eyes are like wide open because we are all waiting when God will fight for us. All of us are going through some sort of a thing that we want, guide, uh, we want God to fight for us. And the thing is when, 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 when God says, I will fight for you, it is not that, uh, that we will have pumped up muscles and then ready to really get on. No, when God says, I will fight for you, then you must be silent. Yes? How many of you believe that? When God says, I will fight for you, then you must be just taking the position. You will not do anything, but then God will fight for us. Because if you start fighting, then you will be fighting in your own strength, not on God's strength. So that's what God was going to teach us because, because we are in his army. There are things that God wants to be aware and he expects certain things that will be hitting us. Okay, Because this is a spiritual warfare, then you must also expect certain spiritual attacks, assaults on us. Okay, I'll explain what are those are. Uh, specifically, God highlighted or God told Five things that we as God's army will be facing. We will be encountering these assaults on our life. Before we go into that, we need to clearly understand and this fight is not physical. Okay, how many of you believe that? This fight is not physical. So that's why the title is, it's not flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood. So let's all go to uh, book of Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 13. And then from there, we will uh, take it on. If anyone can read it louder, Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Okay, media team, we will do the drill. We will not show the uh, verses to them until they open the Bible and read it. Later, we will show them. Okay, so somebody can read it louder. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. Yes. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms. The last line also. That Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. The verse clearly says that the fight that we are going to be in is not flesh and blood, but then it is the fight against who? Fight our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the there are a couple of things mentioned. Against the rulers, 
against your manager, against your mother-in-law, against your friend. No, oh sorry, it is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark, against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms. So we are not fighting human. All we agree? Yes, we are fighting the spiritual forces that is behind or beyond them, which is operating through them, using them. So we cannot fight this battle in the uh, physical layer, but you need to understand this battle is real and it is happening in the physical, okay? There are spiritual battles that is coming in the form of your office. There are coming in the form of your relations. There are com that are coming in the form of your own family. So the battle is real and it is physical too, but the only thing is you can overcome this battle through spiritual. You cannot fight it. You can fight only in the spiritual realm. So that's why it, the starting it says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, which means it implies the human effort is inadequate and God's power is invincible. Sometimes the problem, the, the person who is giving problem to you, you may not be able to fight because they, he or she is a little more muscular than you. You cannot really go and fight. Your power is inadequate, but God's power is invincible. You cannot fight certain people in this physical realm. You cannot fight certain institutions. You cannot fight certain system of this government. You will not be able to fight physically. You cannot go fighting in the court every now and then because you don't have the strength because your power is inadequate. But God's power is invincible. So reading this scripture, you have certain caution given here. What is this caution number one? Is that the caution against lashing out against the human opponents as, as though they are the real enemy. Who is the enemy in Ephesians 10, and 10 to 13? 6, 10 to 13? That is mentioned here. Rulers, okay. Not only Ephesians, but in all over the Bible, the enemy is only one person. Who? Satan. Simple as that. So, it is not your brother who is fighting with you. It is not the person who is fighting with you. It is not a human. Okay? We, sh we should be careful because sometimes we lash out against the people thinking that they are the enemy. No. It is... The enemy is Satan. The second thing is caution against assuming that the battle can be fought using merely human resource. You're trying to fight it with your own human resources. You're trying to gather some influence. You're trying to approach certain people to influence that person. You are gathering your friends. Come on, fight with me. Fight for me. It won't happen in your human mere resource. It will not happen. But it has to be fought in a different realm. It has to be fought in a different realm. For the past couple of months, uh, we as pastoral team, we've been uh, constantly working on many things, trying to set, down, uh, set right certain things, and then counseling them, talking to them, engaging in the spiritual war. And then uh, there are times that it really frustrates us. Okay, a, bang, a month back, uh, I was just traveling and then uh, as I was in the plane and, uh, and uh, after some time, the plane goes into a level where it goes above the clouds. Okay, it goes above the clouds. And then when you see the cloud from the top, it is beautiful. Okay, you are very close to the cloud. Only thing is you can't touch it. Okay, but then it is very beautiful. And there, God reminds me of the scripture. How many of us, or many of us would have uh, read this passage, okay? God actually gave protection to the Israel using the cloud of pillar and, and, and pillar of fire. Okay, we have seen or we have heard this pillar of cloud and fire from the earth seeing the cloud. We have seen our clouds, okay? In, in the rainy season, you have, you have a dark cloud. Sometimes it is white. Okay, you have seen the cloud from the earth, which is a little more, not little more, it is much, much more in somewhere. You have seen the cloud. You have a different feeling, okay? But then when you get onto the plane and you go close to the cloud and you're just next to it 
and oh, you cannot touch, but then you have a different feeling altogether. And then little more higher, you see the cloud from the above and it looks like a cotton candy hung in from the heavens. It is beautiful. And you see the earth from there. Many of you would have gone through the experience. It's mind-blowing. You have an altogether super experience. And God is saying, that's the cloud I'm placing as a protection for you. That's the cloud that I'm placing as a direction for you. So if when I move the cloud, okay, God moves the cloud. Okay, take it, put it there. Then Israel go. And God moves it there, Israel go. If I'm holding it, hold that's how God orchestrates. When you see the world from the eagle eye view of God, from above, you see it all together in a different perspective. So while on this plane, God was teaching me this. Hey, you guys are fighting this war. It's a spiritual war. And you need to get onto the plane, go above the clouds and view from above. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that. That's encouraging. Why? Because when you fight this in the physical, you're fighting with your own human resource, human power. Sometimes we won't be able to. But then when you get on up and see from how God sees it and then allowing God to work on it. And that's where now when on the plane, when you read, Lord, you said uh, you, will, you will give the pillar of cloud and fire. It is touching, it is soothing, and it is actually bringing a lot of emotions out. Why? Because you are just near the cloud. Sometimes you are passing through the cloud, sometimes you are above the cloud, and you have a beautiful experience of the word coming real to you. Amen? So, the same thing has to happen because it is spiritual. It is not physical at all. Our problems, our issues, our war is not physical. But we need to understand, in this war, you will have certain assaults coming in. God wants you to be aware of these assaults because you are signed in, in the contract of being in God's army, fighting for his kingdom in the reality, spiritual reality. So you will face assaults. And God wants to highlight there are five assaults in the coming days as a church we might go through. Or no, not might. You will go through. And God wants to be well aware of it. When such thing comes, get onto the plane, go above the clouds, have an eagle eye view of the problem. Okay, so the first assault that I want to take you through is the character assassination. Character assassination. What is this character assassination? Let's read Ephesians 6 verse 14. Ephesians 6 verse 14. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the best breastplate of righteousness in place. We keep this verse and then we'll go to Isaiah chapter 11, 5. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. Why I choose these two chap uh, passages that will give you an imagery of the Old Testament having... Uh, a belt buckled and then the, the New Testament belt buckle also. All right, so there are two things that is mentioned here. One is the belt of truth buckled around the waist and then the breastplate of righteousness. Two imagery. What is this two imagery uh, tells us is that first thing, okay, belt and breastplate, it reflects the warrior's character. Okay, belt. How many of you, or maybe many of you would have born during the 70s, 80s, okay? If you're 80s kids, you will definitely know. Okay, when those days, uh, we never had this kind of a jogging pant, track pants, okay? All this is, they will wear veshti, okay? Mundu, if you're Malayali, if I'm pronouncing it somewhere wrong, please forgive me. But then mundu, okay, if you're having the mundu around you and you want to run, they don't run like this, okay? You can't, even you're running. So what they do is, they just, they have a style, okay? They just put the leg like this and then take it and then you tie a knot, okay? So when you are in such position, you run fast, okay? The same imagery is being, uh, uh, is being given here. What is that? When a man, when a man, vigorous, he is in a vigorous position to fight certain thing, he actually ties his loose, hanging, flowing garment and he ties it with a belt around his waist, Okay? So this belt, okay, those days it will be like this much, okay, this big. 
okay, and uh, uh, you have uh, positions to place uh, certain little, little weapons, okay, inside the belt, okay, and you have a little coin pocket, all of that, okay, some of you would have got beaten by the belt also by your parents, okay, okay, those are the times that we got, yes, that's, that's the way they punish us, okay, when, once you get that punishment, you will never do the mistake again in your life, okay, that's the kind of punishment we went through, okay, these days the bells are all very fancy, okay, the belt can actually break while you're beating, but then those days it won't. It will rip off your uh, muscles. Okay, that's the kind of a belt, very strong. Actually, they tie around their waist because they are taking position in a fight. It represents that. And it says, belt of what? Truth. What does the truth denotes or refers to? God's? God's word, okay. Okay, we have another uh, um, imagery for the God's word at the end of the passage. Okay, anything else? What it refers to, truth. Okay, it's simple as that, character. Okay, is the person truthful? When you're, when you're recruiting somebody, will you be a truthful person? Will you be a faithful person? Are you a good guy? So, the truth of, uh, the belt of truth, the truth represents the character. Okay, the same as that, the, the, the righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is also the character, the nature of the person. So when you are having the truth that is tied around you, when any kind of assault come, you are still able to withstand. Because the whole passage actually gives us an imagery when the assault comes. It's not about uh, the, 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 the huge, huge invasion of demon coming and attack you. Not that imagery. Okay, rather than it is how the soldier takes a stand when there is an assault happening on him. Yes, assault is painful. It is not that easy to take the assault, but still you are a powerful soldier. You are a determined soldier who will not just lay down by the attack, rather than you take a stand and you are positioned, you are standing and taking the assault. That's the imagery that you will have to have when you are reading through this passage. So having this belt around, the truth, come what may, you are not going to compromise your character. The first attack is that Satan will, because you are in God's army fighting for his kingdom, the first assassination will be your character. He will bring character assassination. You would have not done anything, but then people will actually bring character assassination. Spiritual assault by the enemy. The breastplate of righteousness in the scripture in the Old Testament, Isaiah 59, 17 and Psalm 104, all of that, when the cloth of righteousness is worn, actually it gives the imagery where God steps out to bring justice to his people. He wears the cloth of righteousness because it is his nature. It is his character. He would not show partiality. He would not favor one over the other. He would not actually sideline with somebody rather than he is a just God. So he put on the cloth of righteousness where he judges people with just. He brings about justice with just. So it shows the nature and character of God. Because it's the armor of God, it is also applicable to us. We have the armor of God or we should put on the armor of God on us. The truth, uh, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness denotes our character. So we need to be aware that because we are engaged in this, we will face character assassination. But remember, the warrior's victory or the warrior's character is their defense. You cannot fight when people say an or because sometimes influential people will do this. You will never be tamper the influence and you will never be able to prove them rather than your character will be your defense. It is character, not brute fo uh, force wins the battle. No, because you stand to your character, God will bring the victory in your life. Amen? Amen. Never compromise this. The second thing is, the second uh, um, uh, assassination or the second assault is that your status with God, your status with God, a new relationship with God. What is this? Ephesians 6.15, it says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Your feet, your feet 
fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Romans 5.1 says this way, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Consider this imagery. Okay? In the olden times, when kings and prophets are there, a messenger will be in the army. Okay? He runs from the battleground to the king and the people, announcing him or giving them a message. So this messenger will not have any uh, foot gear. He will not have any shoes. Okay, rather than he runs bare. Why? Because his aim is that I take the message, run fast, and then reach my king and tell the news. Okay? He takes the message from the battleground. King, we won the battle. Or he takes the message from the battleground. He says, king, we lost it. We lost so many people. He runs barefoot. But then if you come to the New Testament, the Roman soldiers... Okay, if you take that imagery of uh, uh, the messenger running, it says uh, feet fitted with the readiness of a gospel, uh, the message that comes through the uh, gospel of peace. So we, here we have a foot gear, a protective, supportive foot gear. You're not running barefoot, rather there is a protection gear. So if you see the Roman soldier's foot gear, it will be like a normal uh, sandal with a lot of thongs to tie around your leg. But then underneath the sole, there will be hobnails where you can just crush anything and keep walking. All terrain, long run, you will keep walking. You will never bother about what kind of, a, uh, what kind of a ground is that, what kind of a terrain is that. You keep moving. They, they have this kind of a system so that the, the soldiers, the, the, the army will not stop anywhere. They keep crushing everything and going. So now we have been given this feat fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. We are all messengers of God. We are all messengers sent, by, sent from God's army to take the gospel, to go and share it to the ends of the nation. And we will have to walk all terrain, whatever the terrain it may be. You'll have to keep walking. So you cannot stop anywhere. So in that case, this hobnail, um, a hobnail, uh, foot gear is going to help you. For us, the hobnail foot gear is the gospel of peace. Say it again. Gospel of peace. Because we have the gospel of peace. Roman says, because we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. That becomes the protective foot gear for us. So, what is this peace of God? You remember, uh, the peace of God is because... We were, once we were, Roman, if you read the passage, Roman uh, full passage, it, it clearly tells us that once we were all enemy, once we were all hostile to God, but now he calls us sons and daughters. He calls us his friends. That's what the scripture says. God calls us as friends. How it happened? It happened through the death and resurrection of his son. Because he died for our sins, now the hostility, now the gap between us and God has been removed and we are able to have this relationship with God. Once humans were enemies to God, we were not having peace. Humankind and God, no peace. But then through the death of Christ, there was reconciliation that brought forth the reconciliation and we made peace with God. So now my identity is that I call my father above father. I call Jesus also father sometimes. I don't know. But Jesus, God said, okay, Jesus, you, you are co here with Jesus. Which means Jesus Christ is our brother. How many of you believe that? Only thing is in Tamil, we say, yes, appa, yes, appa, and we made him appa. Nothing wrong in calling him appa also. But then Jesus Christ is co here. We are co here with him. So we have a new relationship. What is this? Like, He's my friend. God, my God is my friend. My God is my father. The interesting thing is, Satan comes and brings an assault in that relationship. Something happens in your life and then now you are on a question mark saying, or you are having doubt, Lord, really you love me? Am I really saved? Am I really your son? You have a lot of questions. Why? Because, see, the peace, the gospel of peace is your faith foot gear, the protective gear. With that only, you can run, take the message of God to the ends of the nation. If that gear is tampered, if that gear has been assaulted, the peace of God, it is not merely just the peace of mind. 
okay? It is an objective relationship that you have with God. It is not just a peace of mind, but then it is the relationship that you have with God. If you have tasted the peace of God, you will never leave it. So Satan will try his best to assault that peace. An assault can come to tamper this relationship, which is the protective gear for you, and he will try to snatch it away from you so that you will never be able to run for God. We need to be very clear because people's words, their actions can tamper this peace of God that you have. Sometimes people will push you to the place where you will start questioning your own faith, whether I have been saved or not, whether God called me to do this or not. You will have all sort of questions. Several years before me and my friend who were doing ministry together, and then uh, we, having, we were having a normal fun-filled conversation, and then suddenly that fun-filled conversation is taking a different route. Okay, that's where the Bible says, limit your fun. Okay, sometimes all of our fun-filled conversation over a period, it will become a heated argument. How many of you have experienced? Okay, don't say that you didn't do that. Because all of us in some place at point, one point of our life, we would have had this conversation with your friend or somebody having fun, fun, fun. Sometimes uh, in, how, in our houses, we'd have, they would have told us, hey, romba sarika dara, So they would have told us. So you had a fun-filled conversation and then conversation is getting serious now and uh, my friend is charging me something and I'm saying no and he is charging me, I'm saying no, back and forth and then uh, we just, at the end of the day, we went home and then because he was charging me so much, I was like kind of, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'll check that out. And I went back and I, whatever that uh, my friend was charging, I was just checking it, but then I found it was nothing wrong in me, maybe uh, my friend is pointing it out in the wrong way. So the next day when we came and then my friend again picked up a... Then uh, slowly now the serious arguments become a heated argument. And then my friend said, okay, hey, because you did this, I will make sure that you will not be able to do the ministry. I will shut down the ministry that you're doing. I will do this thing to you so that you will not be able to do this ministry. The moment you hear such words, the moment you hear such words, it will deeply go into your heart. It will sit, take the place and it will start spoiling your heart. It will start spoiling the peace of God that you have. And it will disturb you so much. Went into the presence of God. Start crying and ask God, what's happening? God said, come on, get onto the plane. Let's go above the clouds. Okay, now you have to start seeing the problem in God's view. If you are fighting and if you are thinking uh, in the physical realm, you will not have uh, answers or you will start fighting it in your own strength. God took me on the plane again. Not, not physically, I'm, I'm very uh, metamorphically, uh, metaphorically I'm saying this, okay? So, went on the plane, above the clouds, you start seeing the problem and God is telling, okay, these are the problem with the person and because of that, they are hurting you. You don't take it personally, rather than you take it spiritually and love them so that they will know that they are being loved and they will not react. And then when I come back, start slowly getting that guidance from God and start really uh, getting on to my friend, correcting, trying to resol uh, resolve certain things. It went on. But then during this season, during this season, because when this was happening around the month of December and a few days you're entering into the new year and you don't want to enter into this new year with all sort of resentments and all sort of emotional breakdowns and you don't want to get into this new year like that. Easily, Satan will actually bring an assault about the relationship that you have with God and pull you down from what you are about to do. So we need to be very clear. When such things are happening, we need to quickly go and ask God, Lord, fight it. And you be quiet. As I mentioned, when God fights, you have to be quiet. Okay? Sometimes... Being in that place, you will feel ashamed. Being in that place, you will feel that you are a foolish guy. Feeling, uh, being in that place, you will feel that you are, you are tied up, that you can't do anything, but still go through it. Because God will fight for you. You will have victory. Amen? The third assault will be on your faith. Okay? You are a member of God's army. 
then you will have a salt on your faith. How is it? Let's go to Ephesians 6.16. Ephesians 6.16. It says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming arrows of the evil one. This is one verse. Let's go another verse. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For every child of God defeats these, this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. Okay? Consider the, uh, consider the, the shield of a Roman soldier. They have a big shield. And then the shield will have, on the top of the shield, you will have a leather sheet covering the shield. They soak the leather sheet in the water and then they go on. So when a flaming arrow, so those days they have the technique, so they put fire in the uh, spearhead and then they just do the arrow. So when a flaming arrow comes, it hits the shield. It will not burn rather than the fire will be foot put off because the leather which is soaked in water is attached in the shield. Our faith is like that. You hold the shield of faith which will put off all the flaming arrows of the enemy. What is this flaming arrows? 1 John 5, 4 says, every child of God defeats the evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith. So we need to understand what is this faith? Two things. One is, through faith, you have come to God from the world. Okay? Through faith, you have come to God from the world. Which means, basically, if you see, the world is offering a lot of things to you. Luxury, money, relationship, and, and all the prosperity. Even Satan used this technique to tempt Jesus. He said, okay, see all the world, I'll give it to you. The same thing, world offers many things to you. But then... You still choose God in faith. Okay? Abraham, God said, Abraham, move out of your father's house. Okay? In faith, Abraham left his father's house. In faith, he stepped out of his father's house because God did not, God, God did not tell him what route, when, how, all those details. He just said, I'll give you, I'll take you to the nation that is flowing with milk and honey. But then what route, when, how, no. First thing is, okay, in faith, step out from your father's house. But if you see the other side, Abraham's father has a lot of money. Wealthy guy. Lot of servants to help. Food is there. But the other side, just the open door, not knowing where to go. Just the next step, what he has to do. Lot of hope. Here, only the next step. Promising environment. Here, he'll have to navigate. The world gives this, okay? Promising, very futuristic, beautiful. But then in God, you will have to just depend on God. Faith is something not comes through what you see, but then faith comes through what you don't see. Right? Faith comes by not seeing what you see, but then faith comes by what you not see. In that case, this is open wide. You'll have to navigate. You'll have to be in the presence of God and find out. This is so promising. But still, we said, okay, in faith, I will take this direction going with God. First thing, in faith, you came to God. The second thing is, continuing day by day uh, in faith, you gain the victory. Is that you take the step of faith every single day in this journey. And uh, you will sight in your, in your, in your, as you walk in your sights, you will have flaming arrows that comes to you and you will have to guard it with the shield of faith. Keep moving on. But then as you move, sometimes what happens, the first flaming arrow is that you met with an accident or somebody met with, your, met with an accident in your family. What happens? It shakes your faith. God, why to me? Just because I did this for your kingdom, am I receiving this? So what happens? As you are moving forward, you've been pulled back somewhere and then you're trying to move forward and then there is a major sickness that is coming flaming arrow but then hold the shield of faith got it otherwise you will be pulled back again you will lose somebody as you are moving forward you will lose somebody flaming arrow which is a flaming arrow 
hold the shield so that you will not be drawn. Otherwise, you will be drawn back again. Back and forth, you're going up, but then something hits your faith. Going up, something questions your faith. Going up, something comes that actually shakes your faith. Many of the times our sickness are like that. It comes and it questions you. Today is well spoken or majorly spoken is that cancer. It comes, it shakes the whole family, not just the person. Along with it, if you are not taking the stand, just like the belt of truth and holding the position, if you are not doing so, you will be shaken. Satan throws that assault on your faith to shake you. It's not that easy. Then you have to keep moving forward, keep moving forward, holding the faith. That's how we win the victory. That's how we win the victory. I'll tell an, I'll tell an uh, uh, boxing, about a boxing match in one of the movie. Okay, I'll be silent in that, okay, because I don't know whether I can use that example. But then there are two guys like Apollo and Rocky. They were fighting a big match. And then this Apollo is a prime boxer. He is in his prime time. He is an undefeated champion. And he's fighting all the matches and he's straight winning all the matches. But then comes Rocky who is trying and he's entering into this boxing uh, field and he's slowly winning matches. And now it is the prime champion and the entry guy. Somehow Rocky wins the match. Brutal match. The undefeated champion, now it is defeated by a new guy. Both of them are in hospital after the match because they got a lot of hurts, cuts, because the match was brutal. And then slowly a day after, Apollo recovers first. And then he walks into the room of Rocky. And he's saying, Rocky, how are you doing, man? We had a good match. And then the Rocky is saying, Apollo, did you give the best match out? Did you give the best match fighting with me? Or you just let me win? Why I'm saying this, sometimes after hearing this story, seeing this story, I was really inspired. Okay, I want to fight this fight with Satan like this. I don't want the silly matches. I don't want the simple matches. I want the hard matches that I would fight win in the faith and win because God is fighting for me. Amen. So when we will have to give him the challenge, hey, Satan, are you giving the best? Try it out because it is God who is fighting for me, not me. Hallelujah. Okay, we have to be in that level of faith. We have to be that level of faith. When Satan hits something, trying to assault our faith, we will give him a challenge. Satan, you can't do anything. Try the best out and we will still win because God is fighting for us. Our faith has to grow into that level. We are in God's army. We are not in the army of some physical things, but then we are God's army. And we have to be a, 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 we have to be a soldier who stands out there facing any kind of assault. The final assault is that, oh, sorry, fourth assault is that prayer life and devotion unto the word. You will have an assault on this area. Your prayer life and a devotion unto the world. We will quickly read this verse. Ephesians 6, 17. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, reminds us that the battle is spiritual and must be fought in God's strength. Okay. We will come to the helmet of salvation later. But then now, the sword of the Spirit is what? The sword of the Spirit is what? Word of God, right? And then what is the 18th verse starts with? 17th verse ends with this. And then 18th verse starts with what? And pray. And pray. So traditionally we have heard this. Okay, all the other uh, weapons are for defense mechanism. And that one offense, uh, weapon is that the word of God. But I would also like to say that word of God and prayer. Okay, this becomes our weapon. This becomes our weapon. In uh, Romans 8, 26, it says, when, when, uh, when we are weak, Holy Spirit helps us. He intercedes and He prays for us. And he even, even He goes and He groans where words, words cannot express. We must draw our strength in the Word of God 
and on God through prayer. Our strength is in the word of God. Our strength is in God through prayers. So when we are in this army, our prayer life will actually take a toll. Your time in learning the scripture will be affected. In a month, so we will be entering into this new year. So many of us will get into this resolution. Okay, I want to take a resolution. In a year, I will finish the whole Bible. Some will say, I'll read all the prophetic book in a month. Well, started in the first day, seven days gone, everything is going well. Eighth day, you slept slightly, missed. Ninth day, uh, somebody called you so that you, you were having a sleepover somewhere and then you couldn't really make it. Tenth day, you got busy. Eleventh day, you got the sh uh, shift change. So twelfth day, there is no plan. Drop off the plan. You're not moving anywhere. You will get assault on devotion unto the word. You will be busy doing God's work, forgetting God, to spend time with the one who gives that work. Our prayer life and devotion unto the word will actually hit. It will get hit. Sometimes uh, we may have a valid reason. Valid reason. Sometimes you are lazy to accept that. Okay, let's admit that. We are lazy to take the Bible and read. Sometimes we don't have enough time. Yes, truly. Your manager is not there, so you will have to share his uh, work and uh, you are extending your work timings and no time for you. Sometimes you say the environment is not conducive, so I'm not able to. True, I'm telling you, because when you're coming from a non-believing background, for you to take time to learn the scripture, the environment won't be conducive because your family members will be around you and you have a lot of challenges. Not real reasons. But I want to also remind you, it is not flesh and blood, it is spiritual. So what we are going through, my prayer time is getting hit, my devotion unto the word is getting hit. It is not just the physical, it is spiritual. It is spiritual. So me being lazy is not just physical, but then it is spiritual too. Talking about this, uh, um, few years before we had a prayer meeting or uh, pastors, we had to conduct prayer uh, meetings and each of us have been scheduled to do the prayers. Okay, we'll have to go around the clock and uh, conduct the meeting. And then one of our pastor uh, finished his schedule and he came out of the room, I mean, came out of the hall and then there was one old auntie who came close to him and then uh, she said, Pastor, what you're doing is wrong. Like he was like, okay, what did I do? What is the wrong thing? She said, what are you having in your hand? iPad. Okay, that's the wrong thing. What, do, what is wrong with the iPad? Okay, you are going and leading prayer, but you're not having Bible in your hands. And you're leading with iPad. And she's telling you, tell me, Bible, it says, holy Bible is written. But in iPad, whether it is written, I, holy iPad, no. This is wrong. You're a pastor and you should do this. Like, okay, that's nice. We will get on to some questions now. Okay, did Jesus carry Bible when he was ministering? Never in the scripture we see that. Okay, I, have to, I will get the context clearly because some already having like, you are like, eyebrows are going like this. And then you're like, hey, you don't want to tell, you don't want to read scriptures. That's fantastic, hallelujah. Somebody already said hallelujah. Pastor is taking us somewhere. No, 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 you must read Bible. Like I'm, I'll get on. Okay, did, did Jesus... Did Jesus had any scripture, uh, had, have any scriptures with him when he was going and ministering? No, right? But then we can say that Jesus was the word. Jesus himself the word. But uh, did the apostles had any scriptures along with them when they are going and uh, evangelizing and uh, preaching? Any scriptures that says that apostles had so and so scriptures? No. But then the New Testament was written by the apostles. New Testament itself was written by them. Then how do we do? How did the early church learn the scripture? How did they devote themselves to the word of God? Today at least we have, because of technical advancement, uh, we have uh, all possible ways to get the scripture into our own hands. Mobile we have, iPad we have, all kinds of uh, fashioned uh, uh, leather Bibles all there. But those days I don't think they had all of that. 
They had leather parchments. Apostles, God said, okay, you guys take only two dresses and go. If somebody asks one, give them and you just go on. They don't have the backpack, okay, and to fill all the bags with the leather parchments. Nothing. They just went on. How did the early church learn the scripture? The, the Bible clearly says, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostle. In all of this, they never compromised learning the word of God. Even I am not saying, okay, because somebody mistook me saying, Anna, you are saying that uh, we don't have to read the Bible. No, 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 you must read Bible. Okay, let me be clear. You must read the word of God. You must learn the word of God. In fact, you must master the word of God. But how? Any, any guesses? How did the early scripture, the early, early church, they learned the scriptures? By heart, okay? And with the help of the Holy Spirit, okay? Any other any other. Thing. Yes. Public reading. Okay, yes. Any other? I didn't get you. Letters. Okay. Any other way? How did they learn the scriptures? If you see in the Bible, they learned the scripture as a community. They learned the scripture as community. If you take the Old Testament, Hebrew schools were there to teach the Torah. Rabbis were there to teach them. They didn't give them the copy of a PDF and then go learn it. No. Today we have that. Okay. Everyone will be sent PDF and you learn. Whether you want to grow or not, we will send you. Just take it and grow. The apostles, they sat with the people. The elders of the household, they sat with the people. As a community, they were learning the scripture. They had discussions. So that's why we tell them, hey, come to life group. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I, once again, I want to emphasize, I'm not canvassing for life groups. But then I also want to say that in household, what we do is that we learn the scripture together. Just as how it was happening in the early church time. They learned the scripture and then they discussed. For them, learning is not just hearing, but then learn and also apply that into their life. You have to learn and live by the word of God. That is devotion unto God. That is devotion unto God. You will have an assault on this. You will not be able to do this. I know a sister who can, who, who memorize all the Psalms. 119, she has all the verses by heart. If you say start, she will finish off. But then if you ask her to share her plate with somebody, share the... The chairs, okay, maybe some, uh, some uh, underprivileged people can come and say, no, 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 pastor, I can't do this. The least that I travel is only airplane. I don't go less than that. Man, you have everything in your mind, but it is hard for you to bring it to your heart and apply that in your life. Then what's the use of memorizing all of it? Memorizing is not a wrong thing, but then unless you make it as an application into your life, living with that, that's the problem. The word of God should govern us rather than it is presented in a durable form. The word of God should govern us. It should lead our life and we should be obeying to it. And all of it, the word of God can be lived only in the context of a community. Okay? How you are saying? The whole of the Old Testament was given to the community called Israel. The whole of the New Testament is given to the community which is the early church. Okay, you cannot exercise the word of God. You cannot live by the word of God alone. Pastor, I pray, I read Bible, I take care of my own things. I, I strictly follow the scripture instruction, do your business. Mind your own business. That I am following very strictly. No, no, no. You cannot live the word of God unless you are in a community. Consider this, you are the only person in the face of the earth and uh, when you are reading this passage, love is kind. Beautiful, it is. Love is kind when you are the only person in the face of the earth. But then now, you have your sister, you have your brother and you have a friend who always nudges you and you also have your mother-in-law along with you. Now you try to say, love is kind? Is it kind? No. You cannot exercise that. Why? Because... Somewhere, you need a community to shape you. The community shapes you. That's why the scripture says, uh, the word of God is used to correct and rebuke people. 
the word of god has to be learned in the community as a community we will have assault in this matter you coming to life group is not something physical it's not something that you are not interested no 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 this is something spiritual we need to be we need to be well aware of this and we need to take some action we need to take our position stand strong ready to face any assault because we are soldiers in god's army amen the last assault is your salvation satan brings certain things to really question your salvation let's read this okay it's already there in uh, chapter 6 verse 16 it says sorry 6 verse 17 put on salvation as your helmet so what is helmet used for protection to escape from the traffic police okay simple as that yes helmet actually protects people and but under certain circumstances it is also this what is that it is also provides a striking victory strike striking symbol of a military victory when they see their helmet coming from a long way they see the helmet okay they see the feathers of their helmet which means our army has won the battle it's a providing symbol of a striking military victory it is also okay so it is it is protecting but at the same time it denotes the victory what is this all that makes up our state of salvation by his atonement and grace received in earnest now hoped for in perfection hereafter because of his atonement because of what he did on the cross you have received salvation you have received in earnest now hoped for in perfection hereafter your salvation has to be perfected and it has to be worked out let's read this also the helmet defended the head a vital part and and so the hope of salvation will defend the soul and keep it from the blows of the enemy a soldier would not fight well without a hope of victory a christian could not contend with his foes without hope of final salvation but sustained by this what has he to dread any soldier who goes into the battlefield he is not expecting okay anyway i'm going to defeat get defeated no even if he is in the least army in this world he still get down into the battlefield expecting that i would win i would fight and i will win we as christians yes what is what is making us to go through this journey is that the hope of salvation hope of that final salvation that's why we read in the funeral service uh, thessalonians 15 chapter saying one day we will all meet we have the hope because we are saved through christ if you are not saved through christ you don't have this hope also our hope of final salvation actually pushes us but then you will have to work out your salvation too what we have received at the juncture of christ's death burial and resurrection is the entry ticket consider like this okay it's not literally i'm talking about but then consider like this it's the entry ticket but then you've been given you will have to go work out if jesus christ is standing at the gate of a maze okay maze we all know right so he is standing at the gate of a maze is it okay because i am gracious to you i love you so much i give you this entry ticket the salvation go on now as you go into the maze you will have to navigate your own way sometimes there are glass doors that reflects you that you are not able to find your own way then you turn and then you go somewhere you have to come out of the maze that's the final salvation in between in between satan will throw different kind of assaults that will constantly make you to not to work out the salvation so that you will stay right here but i want to remind you god is coming for that if you are staying here you will not make it at the end of the day it's like a maze 
you have the entry ticket you go and then navigate work it out and then somehow you come out of that maze and that's the final salvation if you're not able to work out your salvation then that's the assault that actually satan is throwing at you be careful and we may ask lord uh, pastor then can we earn the salvation no definitely you cannot do that why because ephesians 8 uh, ephesians 2 8 to 10 clearly says that salvation is a gift from god it is the grace of god through faith you have received it that's why i said through faith we made the choice from world to god through faith you have received salvation it is the grace of god it is a gift of god you cannot work it out i mean you cannot earn it but then you must also work out your salvation for the final day anyone who is not in the process of working out their salvation day in day out if that's a spiritual assault on you quickly recognize it get on to the plane go above the clouds we need to do this work we need to do this work why because we are signed in the contract of god's army we are in the spiritual warfare and we are soldiers who need to be strong okay if we are not able to withstand this assault we will be slain we will be slain and we don't want to be casualty so we need to be really really careful so these are the five assaults that god wants us first thing is character assassination when you feel that you have been your character has been assassinated get on to the plane okay the second thing is your status with god your relationship with god that is the second uh, uh, assault that satan will try to do on you the third thing is satan will try to assault your faith fourth thing is satan will try to assault your prayer time and your devotion to the word of god the fifth thing is satan will try to assault your salvation but whenever this happens quick to highlight quick to sense this get on to the plane because you are a soldier you need to stand strong facing any sort of assault amen can we all just close our eyes and pray to god father we pray that you would a father come and equip all of us so oh father today oh father we make this oh father that we belong to you we belong to your army oh father and we want to be the strong soldier who stands and faces any sort of any sort of assault so father we would not be slain why because you are our strength oh father so lord we pray that help us to get over this help us to get past this oh father so that that we would be able to glorify your name oh lord spirit of god we pray that you would equip each one of us lord in this army we are all together no one is separate no one is left alone we are an army we work together So Lord we pray that you would build this beautiful bonding of oh father that each of us will stay connected with one another and we will fight this battle of oh father Lord we just completely surrender everyone into your hands may your name shall be glorified in Jesus mighty name we pray amen amen